Buckle up for a new episode of Bumpaholics, the one and only podcast made to teach on all stages of the arrival of a baby before, during, and after. Whether you're an expecting mother, have questions about fertility, difficulty with lactation, or postpartum, you're sure to learn from our experienced doulas when you listen to Bumpaholics. Okay, so the next topic that she covered um, that was different from what we had previously been discussing was commemorating ceremonies. So she talked about a statue that they had um, kind of in a central park area, which was a baby with wings. And there was a commemorating ceremony that happened there yearly um, where people would come and you know, tell the stories of their stillbirth, their loss, um, and everybody kind of got to know each other, and it became a sort of group thing, um, and it was not religious, even though the baby had wings, and it was hosted by a religious group to start with, but eventually it was moved into a church, and since um, she was not religious, she then felt uncomfortable once it was moved into the church, actually going to the group had stopped attending. Um, but she did feel some relief going to this commemorating ceremony when it was in the open public park. Um, and I kind of wanted to discuss religion as both uh, comfort and also kind of isolating in times of loss. Um, you know, when, when you're going through a loss and you're not necessarily connecting with somebody on their religious level. Um, or if you are very religious and the people who are comforting you are not. Um, have you run into that with clients or with just people in your life where you're not necessarily connecting or you're attending an event where the people who are hosting it and their religion or lack thereof made you feel uncomfortable? Uh, I mean, it's hard to think of specific examples. I, I feel like personally, I'm always in like some sort of mix of the levels of spirituality with the, the people around me. I feel like we kind of, um, I don't know, the people that I interact with are so varied um, and the people that, uh, I've served as clients are, I mean, I don't, I don't have like a, a general, uh, pull towards either very religious people or unreligious people. I've dealt with both. Um, it can be really, like some people can feel very uncomfortable around um, religion, mm -hmm. and you can you can really, I mean, most of the time you can tell. Um, at least I think it's pretty easy to tell whenever someone when like an unreligious person is around someone who's very overtly religious. Um, and then also the other way around. Um, whenever you have someone going through a loss, I feel like it's, I mean, it's always important to kind of read the room, mm -hmm. um, try and tell what it, um, try and pick up on, if what you're saying is actually like comforting to that person or if you're just making them uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, because like uh, maybe you think that um, it would be really comfortable comforting to have someone come in and pray with you during that time but another even if they normally are really religious. A loss is a time that a lot of people have, um, like, can start um, doubting some of their religious beliefs, or like, it can be con it can be in flux during that time. Like, you're just very unsure of you of 
your beliefs and you kind of, sometimes you need to be reminded of what you believed before. Mm -hmm. Um, and not just let this, um, this event, this, um, must be like kind of rock your foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, It, I'm, mm-hmm. it, it's very complex. <laughs> it's it's going to be it's, very complex. It's very complex. And, um, you know, something that we really strive for as an organization um, to recognize that not everybody in our organization is religious. Um, a lot of us are. We were originally founded as a Christian organization and the word ministry is in our name, which tends to attract religious people and religious clients. But keeping in mind that not everybody is and trying to operate in such a way that we're welcoming to people of all religions to feel comfortable with us. Um, it is really nice when I have a Christian client or a Catholic client that believes in the same God as me and we can pray together. And um, I find it makes my job easier when I'm able to to use um, verses in the Bible and whatnot to kind of help clients when they're feeling like their energy reserves depleting or they're questioning why um, or things of that nature that because that's where I come from, but also, you know, working with people who aren't necessarily religious or they are, but like you said, they just don't really want it um, being used as a, as a comfort at that time. And you can, yeah, read the room and tell. Um, I, I don't know. It was, it was interesting for me to read, to see how isolated that she felt. And I felt really sad for her that she lost that because it was moved into a church even though they told her she was more than welcome to come and they kept reaching out to her and asking her to come but she just did not feel comfortable doing so in an actual church which which brought up the questions and the thoughts for me yeah i mean i can understand why that would make her uncomfortable and just because like you're you're going into a sacred space even if the the people of the group are comfortable with it it's still um the church represents something to a lot of different people Mm -hmm. um and so it might maybe the people in the group were okay with it but there are people of the religion that would be feel like it was it would be disrespectful Mm. but I mean when when you're going through a loss I don't whatever is comforting to you I don't think that you need to be overly concerned with um the thoughts of outside parties Mm -hmm. um but I can, I mean, I can see how um, someone might just be uncomfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can as well. Okay, so the next topic. Um, the, I remember when a long time ago, months and months ago, we discussed her conversation with her friend Barb. And we discussed the importance of trying to have people in your lives that are supportive of the decisions that you're going to make and kind of, um, you know, it's good to have tough conversations, but also it's important to, to feel supported. So she talks to Barb again, and she actually tells her that the conversation that she had with her did not help at the time that she had it, but when she experienced the loss, it was actually very comforting to her that because in the earlier conversation with Barb when she was still pregnant, Barb had had such a strong reaction that caused her to question and then reaffirm that she wanted to have a home birth 
so that she knew when she experienced the loss that she really had done her due diligence in research of the safety of home birth and um, hadn't just made the decision on a whim. Um, What kind of conversations do you try to have with your, the clients that you've served um, or that we build into, you know, a lot of our, we have a lot of autonomy for our doulas, but we also um, have kind of required conversations for them to have to make sure that they're covered um, to kind of have those tough conversations before birth. So, I mean, this is such an odd scenario, I feel like, because most of the time, um, like having that kind of um, reaction to uh, a choice that a client is making, um, that's, I mean, I would never recommend like doing. No, 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 no. Not the reaction that she had. The way she did it was terrible. Don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) I don't say much with absolute certainty, but don't do that. (laughs) But the, the tough conversation that, that ended up, you know, the thought process that went through Mm -hmm. the, the, what are the different topics that some people it's better for them to think about before they have the baby, because then if they occur, then there's a plan or there's a process or. Yeah. So we have like, yeah, we have those conversations around like um, preferences for Mm C-sections and, um, and like preparing for uh, NICU stays, those type of conversations we, we have, because it's, I mean, you don't want it to happen, but if it does happen, there are choices that need to be made. And it's so much easier to make those choices beforehand with a clear head whenever you have the time to research it. Um, and just that, that's what I feel is like the true benefit of having a, a birth plan. It's not that you're, um, trying to plan exactly how everything's going to go because you can't, Mm -hmm. but you can see what types of decisions you may need to make and look at what your options are from a place of calm Mm -hmm. and not in the moment while uh, emotions are running high and, um, and you're just, I mean, you're, the birth really you uh a lot of people will kind of go into themselves so it's like really hard to communicate your needs during that time like maybe you might not even be hearing anything that's happening in the room Mm -hmm. Uh, so having already had like gone through that decision making process especially having uh, your partner on board or having um, a doula that's aware of what your birth plan is, having those conversations with your care provider um, can make those, that, those things go a lot more smoothly whenever birth goes off the rails, sort mm-hmm. of, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um... And I find it's, it's a a comfort when those things end up happening, um, where you say, you know, I, I, the first time that I had a client after we'd started, um, preparing for C-sections that actually had a C-section, um, which she was my very first client to ever have a C-section. Um, when she realized it was going to happen, she kind of put her hands protectively over herself and said, I didn't plan for this. I didn't plan for this. And I thought, oh, we did. Thank goodness. Um, You know, and I said, you know, we, you do have a plan for this. And I started reciting her C-section birth plan to her. You know, you prefer to have the drape up instead of down. You prefer to do the cotton swab on the face. And as I was listing out her preferences, her hands just got lower and lower until they dropped and she wasn't holding her 
protective over her belly anymore and she started breathing more deeply and she felt more calm, more peace, more control over her situation because she did still have preferences and they were still going to be respected, but could be in him, her control was. Um, that wouldn't have been a good time to ask her, well, do you prefer to have the drape up or down? But she was not in the place to make decisions. It wasn't a good time to be reminded of what she had told me she had already preferred. Um, yeah. That's a big one for us. Definitely always that. And then um, induction preferences as well. Um, what would you like to do first? What's your first step? What's your second step? You know, how do you want this to go? Um, and then if you do end up needing to do an induction of some sort, um, and maybe if the client's feeling a little panicky because they didn't want one, um, or they're tired, there's a lot of different things that can happen. Um, that you can get it out and say, do you remember, is this still what you're comfortable with? And I can kind of bring them back. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, I also just wanted to make a note here that in part four, chapter three, which is on a Kindle, it's LOV um, 2017. It outlines what to expect as far as taxes, death certificates, autopsy reports, things like that. If you are going through a loss or you're supporting somebody through a loss, it's a fantastic chapter to go through to kind of walk you through what those things look like. Um, but we are not going to be necessarily going over each of those individual things here. Um, you would need it written down for you anyway, more than likely. So that's a great place to look for those sorts of resources. Um, and you can also talk to, they've got uh, social workers if you um, are working with a hospital. They can help walk you through that. <laughs> The following media content is intended to only be an educational reference guide and should not be taken as a substitute for medical advice. While KC Women's Ministry adheres to strict self-set guidelines, any advice, instructions, or information found within this media is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. KCWM makes every effort to broadcast correct information. We simply present the views based on evidence-based information. We welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. We are not sponsored by drug or device companies. By listening or viewing this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice to treat any medical condition and either yourself or others, including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast. Under no circumstances shall Casey Women's Ministry, any guests or contributors to the podcast or any employees, associates, or affiliates of Casey Women's Ministry be responsible for damages arising from the use of the podcast. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs>